And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Well, last Sunday I shared some stories with you of my childhood Christmases, but there's one I did not tell you that I wanted to save until today because I feel like it will fit in more appropriately with where I think our discussion this morning is headed. I was about 13, maybe 14, and it was Christmas Eve and we were at my grandparents' house as usual. We'd already eaten and gone to the Christmas Eve service, so it was about 8.30 or so, and we were back at home and a couple people, namely my brothers, were getting bored. So someone got the bright idea to say, well, you know what, it's Christmas Eve, let's open one present. We'll just open one, and then we'll save the rest of it for tomorrow. And I said, fine, if, that, if you want to do that, uh, I'm going to wait. I'll just wait till tomorrow. So they opened one, everybody opened one, and enjoyed it for a while, and that lasted for a few minutes, and then somebody else said, well, you know what, opening another one wouldn't hurt. We've got all these presents here. There'll, there'll still be plenty, so why don't we open another? And I said, fine, if that's what you want to do, but... I think I'll wait. Well, I think you can see where this is headed. By the end of that evening, all of the presents under the tree were opened except for mine. I was the only person who had anything under the tree on Christmas morning. And I flat out told them, they are Christmas presents. They're not Christmas Eve presents. You wait until Christmas morning to open them. Now, this is not a story about my virtue or tremendous self-discipline. All of that's true, of course, but that's not what this is about. As a matter of fact, my wife would say <laughs> self-discipline is really more like stubbornness. I really think this story is more about everybody else and how hard it is to have patience during the Christmas season. How hard that is. We see the presents piling up under the tree. The cookies are growing the size of a mountain and the pies and the advent calendar clicks day by day and we just think Christmas will never get here. We are so impatient. And we're so impatient, I think, in our daily lives. Whether we're sitting in traffic waiting for a light to change or waiting in a drive through line at a fast food restaurant, or simply surfing through channels, trying to get through the commercials to watch a television show. And I think it's no less true that we have impatience in our spiritual lives. We look at the problems in our own lives, some of which are significant. And then we look at everything that's going on around us in the world at large, the violence, and the injustice, and the wars, and the difficulties. And we have a very real tendency to look up to heaven and say, God, where are you? Why aren't you doing anything? Come down and fix all this. Well, that's nothing new. That's been said and thought all throughout human history. It's been said and thought all throughout the Bible. If you've never had a chance to read the short book of Habakkuk, it's toward the back of the Old Testament. Habakkuk was a prophet who lived toward the end of the Old Testament at the time after the exile and return of the Israelites. And this is what he writes in chapter 1. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like something we may have said or thought at one time in our lives? impatience and God's patience. 
Our reading this morning from the New Testament from 2 Peter talks about God's patience and the idea that while we're here asking these questions and wondering where God is, God is where he always has been and is telling us that he works on a different timetable than we do, that he has a different schedule than we do, and that it may take longer for his perfect will to be executed, but it will be done. For him, a thousand days are like a year, and you are like thousand days. God has plenty of time, while we feel we do not. So as we contemplate this idea of patience and our relationship to God within the framework of patience, typically we approach it in two different ways. One is the impatience we have with what's going on in our own lives, our own messes, our own problems. And the other is the impatience we have with what's going on around us, a seemingly evil and cruel and difficult world where injustice never seems to get punished and the right are often ridiculed and marginalized. Well, let's take these one at a time. Let's start with this idea of what's going on in the outside world around us and how do we have patience with all this that we see going on about us. Our reading this morning from Peter tells us that God is patient with us, not seeking that anyone should come to destruction. God, it says, wants all people to be saved, including all those out there that we complain about that are causing all the problems. Could God sweep them away with his hand? Certainly. He absolutely could. And one day he will. But until then, God, who is gracious and merciful, wants to give everyone a chance, including the evildoers, including the unjust, including the unfair. He wants to give everyone a chance to come to his grace and mercy and have a chance to be with him eternally in heaven. That's why God's being patient with the world. That's why God is waiting. That's why God is holding off sending Jesus back. Because once that happens, it's all over. And there's no chance for redemption and forgiveness. And isn't that a good thought in a way? Because I think we can all sit here and think, about friends and loved ones who are at this moment outside of God's grace, who are lost, who are wandering. If God sweeps away everyone, they go with him. But God who is patient and just, not wanting anyone to perish, will give everyone plenty of time, including those that we know that need him so desperately. All right, then what about our own lives? What about the messes we've got going on? We've got some significant problems, don't we? We've got some issues to deal with that we need taken care of, right? I want you to think about what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, where Paul had a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was, but he had a thorn in the flesh and he prayed three times that God would remove it. And God said no. Because God's power is made perfect in our weakness. God's power is made perfect when we are weak. God will, on many occasions, wait in our lives that we may learn to develop trust and faith in Him. Because otherwise, we tend to jump in. We tend to want to go in and do things ourselves instead of waiting for God. I have this problem, admittedly. Like a lot of guys, I'm a fixer. 
and a problem comes up, I want to jump in and fix it. And that's not always the best thing to do. Sometimes the best thing to do is to wait and to pray and let God's power be made perfect in our weakness. That is, we say, God, I can't do it. I can't fix it. You take care of it. Let your power be made known in my life. It shows us and creates in us a further dependence on God. Now, don't be mistaken here. If you've got a major water leak in your house, if a pipe has, has burst, by all means, go in and fix it. Shut off the water main, get a plumber, whatever you have to do. Don't sit there and say, well, here's one of those opportunities for God to show his power. Maybe he'll heal the pipe. You go and fix it. But for these greater issues, and we all have them, relationships, physical health, financial issues, be patient. Wait for God. Let his power be made perfect in your weakness. In a couple of weeks, our daughter Emily will come to visit us for Christmas. We're very excited about that. For you to have the opportunity to meet her, and she's excited about it as well. But Emily is another one of those people that has problems with patience. Her main complaint now is no boyfriend. Oh, well, my friends are all getting married and having babies, and I'm getting left behind, and I'll just be an old maid, and I'll be having 60 cats live with me, and I'll be the crazy cat lady. And this goes on and on. Emily's 25, 25 years old. I was talking to someone last week, and I talked to so many people in the course of a week, I can't remember the exact circumstances. But this person was sharing a story with me about someone he knew who was in her 50s and married, just getting married now for the first time in her 50s. God is not slow in keeping his promises, as some people think. We told you earlier, we read a little bit from the prophet Habakkuk and his complaint and his looking up to God and asking God, where are you? And why don't you do something? Seems only fair now to wrap this up by giving you God's response. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. What a great promise that is for us. If we can only wait, if we can only be patient, if we can only, in a sense, be weak and let God's strength show us the way, if we can only be still, and know that he is God. Amen.